All right. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk today about the uh, psychological status of a theory that has revolutionized the biological sciences, but uh, doesn't seem to have permeated the minds of the general public uh, substantially. And one place where you can see this very clearly is if you look at public representations of evolution. I'm sure you're familiar with graphics like this um, that depict evolution as this uh, linear progression, uh, a staircase, a ladder, a great chain of being. And a much better representation would be something like a tree, or even better yet, a bush. Um, another place where you can see uh, how evolution hasn't permeated, permeated the minds of the general public are in polls of acceptance of evolution. So some of you may be familiar with this graphic, um, which appeared in Science in 2006. And what the authors did is they surveyed the residents of 40 different industrialized nations and asked them whether they thought um, human evolution in particular was true. Um, that's the, the blue bars, uh, red, false, or uh, tan, not sure. And the US is down here at the bottom. It had the lowest acceptance of evolution um, other than Turkey. So about 40% of US residents will claim that evolution is true and another 40% false, and then there's 20% in between. So why has uh, evolution not permeated the minds and beliefs and behaviors of the general public when it's played such an important role in the, uh, the life sciences? Um, in the appendix of that science paper by Miller and colleagues, they actually do some analyses showing that um, religious fundamentalism predicts evolution understanding in those various cultures. But the, uh, it doesn't predict evolution understanding entire, or acceptance entirely. There's still actually a lot of variants left to explain. So one thing that I've been looking at for the last six years or so is um, whether un an understanding of evolution also plays a role in acceptance of evolution. So it might be the case that people who are skeptical of evolution don't actually understand what evolution is and how it works. So what I wanted to do today is actually get to that component last. The first thing I wanted to talk about is just the nature of evolutionary misconceptions, um, how it is that people tend to misunderstand evolution. Then we'll move to the origins of evolutionary misconceptions and talk about some developmental data um, suggesting that there are early developing inductive biases that constrain our understanding of folk biological phenomena and uh, usually in a good way, but in the case of evolution, um, a problematic way. And then finally, um, uh, I'll talk about consequences of evolutionary misconceptions for the acceptance of evolution as true. So let's start off with the nature of the misconceptions. And very briefly, I'm just going to go through uh, Darwin's theory of evolution um, in the way that Ernst Meyer summarized it. Uh, he claimed that uh, Darwin's conceptual change can be analyzed as a series of facts that he became aware of and inferences he drew from those facts. So one fact is that organisms uh, reproduce exponentially. They produce um, far more offspring than the limited resources in the environment can support. Um, if you pair those two facts together, you can infer that there must be a struggle for existence. Um, if you pair that with the fact that not all organisms within a population are the same, there is some variation. Um, then you get the further inference that there are going to be some organisms that are better fit uh, for this struggle for existence. Um, and if you pair that with uh, heritability, that uh, this variation is passed on, then uh, you can finally get to how population, populations might change over time with the organisms who are more fit being more likely to reproduce. Um, so I've just explained the theory in a matter of seconds, and it seems pretty easy to lay out in this framework. Um, and, and you might be thinking, like, you know, what's the big uh, holding point? What's the stumbling block? Why do so few people understand evolution? Um, it's been um, something that's been very thoroughly documented in the evolution education literature. Um, so for the, like the last 20 or 30 years, people have been documenting very consistent misconceptions. Um, one example is that students tend to conflate evolutionary adaptation or adaptation occurring at the level of the species with ontogenetic adaptation, occurring changes occurring in the lifetimes of organisms. So they think that if um, they're described a scenario where a wolf moves to a colder climate and as a result grows a thicker f uh, coat of fur, um, they interpret that as an instance of evolutionary change, just one that can be observed within the lifetime of the individual, whereas most evolutionary changes are so slow you wouldn't observe them in a single lifetime. Um, another common misconception is that uh, 
Students tend to prefer teleological explanations of change to mechanistic ones. So if asked, um, why do ducks have web feet, um, they will appeal to the need for web feet in and of itself as an explanation for the origin. And even if they're taught mechanistic explanations in the context of a biology class, that ducks uh, with more webbing in their, between their digits were more likely to survive and reproduce, and, and that led to this population change, um, they won't adopt that mode of explanation. They'll just resort back to teleological explanations. So where do these misconceptions come from? Um, some people in the literature have pointed to the stuff I started out with, the misrepresentations that you see in popular culture. And you also see these in biology textbooks and in how teachers talk. Um, oftentimes, even biologists will use uh, shorthand uh, metaphors to describe evolution that can very easily be misconstrued as implying that evolution is driven by intentional or teleological processes. Um, so that's, that's one possibility, that they're actually implanted by um, discourse. But another possibility that I'm actually going to be focusing on is the possibility that the misconceptions actually represent an alternative way of understanding evolutionary phenomena that is inconsistent with natural selection. And this alternative way of understanding um, is sort of a byproduct of certain developmental um, biases. And certainly there are misconceptions about evolution in the popular media, but those act to reinforce uh, misconceptions that would arise um, on their own, even if those misconceptions weren't present. Um, so before I get right into um, evolution, I thought I'd just mention two points that provide sort of a priori reason to think that the second possibility is plausible. Um, first of all, there's a large, um, there's a literature on conceptual change in psychology, um, which has taken a, a domain-specific approach. Um, science educators and developmental psychologists have looked from domain to domain um, at the kinds of um, concepts people hold in those domains before acquiring the correct scientific concepts. And what's been found in, in many different domains um, is that uh, students' misconceptions um, are not random and isolated and fragmented, but they actually tend to cohere. Um, and they uh, are stable over time, and the coherence paired with the stability create um, an alternative way uh, for the students to understand the, the phenomena in that domain. Um, and I think the best documented case of this would be in physics, um, where there's many, many studies showing that um, students understand how objects move in accordance with um, something that's more similar to the impetus theory of the Middle Ages than Newtonian mechanics. Um, and this is even students who have had um, one, two um, years of college level uh, physics classes, that when you test them in sort of informal ways where they can't use equations and they're not asked to derive specific numbers, they default to this impetus view of object motion rather than um, Newtonian inertial views. If we look specifically at evolution, um, there's a historical precedent for uh, not understanding evolution in, in terms of, or, or understanding evolution in ways that are incompatible with natural selection. So Ernst Meyer, who's the historian who laid out that set of facts and inferences that I put on a different slide, has done a lot of work describing the difference between Darwinian views of evolution and pre-Darwinian views. Um, and he's uh, ter uh, termed that distinction as a distinction between variational theories of evolution and transformational theories. And I'm going to use those terms throughout. So let me first try to explain them in words, but then provide an illustration. So variational theories of evolution construe evolution as the selective propagation of within-species variation. And um, since Darwin, there have been ma many variants of variational theories, but modern biologists could all be considered as embracing a variational view of evolution. Prior to Darwin, though, um, evolutionary biologists, well, biologists who were interested in evolution, I should say, uh, um, would typically explain evolution as the transformation of an entire species. Um, there is some essence that underlied that species, and it was the essence that was changing over time. So let me try to illustrate this to make it a little bit more concrete. Um, imagine that um, a variationist came upon this sample of data where we've got three generations of moths, uh, or three samples from a particular population, and it appears to be 
changing over time. So a variationist would explain this in terms of selection and mutation. Um, not all the organisms within any given generation would reproduce. Here only the ones that have been circled reproduced and the arrows denote their offspring. The offspring tend to resemble the parents but sometimes they vary and if those variations happen to be particularly um, adaptive for the species current needs uh, it, its current, uh, in its current environment then those variants will be more likely to reproduce. Um, so that's just a, another way of describing variationism. Transformationists would look at the same data differently. Basically, they would ignore the variation within a population and focus instead on the essential moth. Think about the moth species as a whole and what seems to be changing as a whole. Um, and so the, the mechanisms of evolution that pre-Darwinian uh, biologists posited were mechanisms that would operate over the entire species um, or, or at a, some uh, construct that underlied the species um, as opposed to the individuals themselves. So m my research has focused on whether or not modern day students um, are in fact covert transformationists. Do they build a theory of evolution on their own uh, that is more similar to the transformational views of evolution than the correct variational ones? And um, if so, is there uh, a particularly effective way of replacing the um, transformational misconceptions with correct variational conceptions? So that required um, two things. Uh, one, um, uh, a comprehension assessment that was able to differentiate between transformational and variational views of evolution. And then also a teaching intervention capable of moving people from transformational views to variational views. So I'm gonna tell you about a study uh, uh, that, that was a teaching intervention study um, to illustrate both the assessment and the intervention. So this is a snapshot of the assessment tool. Um, what I did was uh, identify six evolutionary phenomena and uh, created a bunch of questions that were designed to um, uh, disentangle a variational and a transformational interpretation of that same phenomenon. So the phenomena were within species variation, parent, offspring, inheritance, uh, species adaptation, domestication, speciation, and extinction. And there's a lot of text here. Um, I'm actually just going to focus on two cases, inheritance and variation, to give you a flavor of the assessment and, and the nature of the difference of, the, of a variationist perspective versus a transformationist perspective. So if we focus in on inheritance, it was predicted that both variationists and transformationists would agree that offspring uh, tend to resemble their parents. Um, uh, you can just see that from casual observation of the biological world or just observation of people. Um, but they would disagree about how to interpret differences uh, between parents and offspring. So variationists were thought to view the differences as random and unpredictable um, as caused by uh, uh, mutations and recombinations, but you didn't need to necessarily know the genetic uh, genetics. You just know that, that the, the differences are random. Whereas a transformationist would see those differences as being adaptive and purposeful, that every difference between an organism and its offspring was a difference in the right direction because offspring would be born um, better adapted to the environment than its parents were if there's some mechanism that's ensuring that the species as a whole is becoming more adapted. So here's one question that got at this difference. Uh, here's the prompt. Imagine that biologists discover a new species of woodpecker that lives in isolation on a secluded island. These woodpeckers have, on average, a one-inch one beak, and their only food source is a tree-dwelling insect that lives, on average, one and a half inches under the tree bark. Compared to its parents, the offspring of any two woodpeckers should develop A, a longer beak, B, a shorter beak, C, either a longer beak or a shorter beak, neither is more likely. So the uh, correct response here is C, that the differences between parents and their offspring are random and, uh, and can't be predicted ahead of time, but the transformational lure was A, that the organisms would be born with a longer beak because they needed a longer beak. And participants were also asked to justify their judgments, and that's typically what happens when they, they choose A. So I've done a lot of studies with a lot of different populations, and typically you get about a 50-50 split between the, the correct answer and the transformational lure. Um, here's a sample question on the top. Well, here's, here's the, the topic of variation and, and how transformationists and variationists differ on that topic. Um, again, it was thought that they would be in agreement about some aspects of the concept, um, in particular that different members of the same species are not identical. That's something you can easily glean from observation of the biological world. But they would um, uh, 
have different uh, expectations about individual differences within the population, um, variationists would see them as fodder for selection. Selection would operate on the differences. And transformationists would see them as minor and non-adaptive or maybe even maladaptive um, because what matters is the underlying essence and any differences uh, around that essence would just be error. Um, so here's a sample task to, to uh, get at that distinction. Um, participants were uh, given this scenario. During the 19th century, England's native moth species, uh, the peppered moth, evolved darker coloration in response to the pollution produced by the Industrial Revolution. Imagine that biologists gathered a random sample of the peppered moth once every 25 years from 1800 to 1900. What color, uh, range of coloration would you expect to find at each point in time? And so I know this story may be somewhat apocryphal, but it didn't matter for the purposes of this question. Um, participants were then presented with this uh, uh, um, chart depicting um, five moth outlines uh, that represented the sample for each um, uh, time point, and then they were asked to color in those samples. So about a third of participants produced response patterns that looked like this, where there was some darker variant and that uh, vari variation spread throughout the population over time. Most participants produced a response something like this, um, that the, uh, uh, the moths are all gradually changing, but there's no variation occurring within the population. All the variation occurs across generations. And, uh, and this is a, actually a very typical response. People will do exactly this pattern uh, more often than not. All right, so those are you know, two sample tasks. Um, now let me tell you a little bit about the participants. Um, they were recruited from um, uh, uh, various courses on evolution and uh, animal behavior at UMass Boston, where a, collabor a collaborator of mine works, Persetta Kalabi. And uh, they actually took this course um, over three different semesters, but there were no differences in the data as a function of semester, so we collapsed the data. and. Uh, this, the assessment had a total of six sections on it, and every section had five questions. Um, and um, every question was coded um, in terms of a trichotomous uh, coding scheme. Uh, you got a plus one if you provided a response that was consistent with variationism, a negative one if you provided a response consistent with transformationism, and then a zero for responses that were vague and ambiguous and thus possibly consistent with both theories. Um, and uh, so the, the range and scores for every section was negative 5 to positive 5, and then the overall range across the six sections was negative 30 to positive 30. And here are the, uh, a frequency distribution of the pretest scores um, for this particular group. Um, so we've got uh, negative 30 to positive 30 on the x-axis and the number of participants on the y-axis, and you can see that just based on score alone, um, about a majority of the participants appear to hold transformational views of evolution and then the minority <laughs> variational views. Now much more informative analysis is looking at how they respond across sections. So um, this is a correlation matrix that just shows you the consistency in responding across sections. Um, Basically, what would happen is that if you provided a transformational response to one section, say the, the section on adaptation, you tended to provide transformational responses to every other section. Or conversely, if you provided a variational response to some sections, you tended to do so for every other section. Um, so uh, tra transformational views were predominant at pretest, and they were also uh, internally consistent. Now let me describe the teaching intervention. Um, this was devised by my collaborator, Prasetta Kalabi. Um, the objective of this intervention was to get students to derive the concepts of evolution and natural selection for themselves from first principles um, in the, uh, the areas of biology and natural history. So she led them through five activities that were meant to simulate um, uh, Darwin's own thinking on, on how he uh, inferred natural selection from the facts and inferences that uh, Meyer attributes to him in that process. And the, the particular focus of those activities was uh, population growth, resource limitation, genetic variation, genetic transmission, and differential survival. So let me just describe the first activity to give you a flavor of the assessment. Um, 
uh, the instructor would start the class with a question like this, why is the earth not covered in dogs? And all the students think it's a ridiculous question, and then she um, poses the question in a more specific uh, way. Well, what if every female dog has 10 puppies in her lifetime? How many progeny, progeny will one female have after six generations? And now they have to make a, a prediction, um, just off the cuff prediction, and then they actually do the math. Um, so if you've got uh, one puppy who get who, one female who has 10 puppies, we can uh, assume that half will be male and half female. And then if we take those five females and each of those has 10, now we've got 50 new puppies, half of which are male, half female. And you add the previous uh, generation's total, and very quickly you get very large numbers. Um, it's an example of exponential growth. And the students then graph those numbers, uh, resulting in something like this. And usually their predictions are a whole magnitude off. They're usually in the thousands rather than the ten thousands. Um, so now, having um, engaged a little bit with uh, super fecundity, um, the students are in a great position to start thinking about how uh, limited resources would curb population growth. And that's how the activities continue on. So these are the post-test scores after undergoing um, a semester on evolution and ecology or animal behavior, as well as this targeted intervention. Um, it's not as dramatic of change as we had hoped. Um, there is a shift away from this strong subset of individuals with uh, transformational scores to a more even distribution where now more, the scores are centered more around zero. Um, these are the two distributions back to back. So you see that um, the students who had robust transformational views are moving more towards the middle. Um, they're actually ending up with a mixed theory. Um, I, won't, I won't go into the exact nature of their theory until maybe during the question uh, and answer period. But one thing that was very interesting was that when you do the correlational analyses on their post-test uh, responses, their responses are still highly intercorrelated, implying that they're still reasoning rather consistently. Um, uh, uh, but um, you've got a, a larger uh, mixture of views. So this is a, another way of looking at those data. If you look at the um, relative gains or losses for individual participants um, as a function of their pretest score here on the x-axis, um, most participants gained uh, some points on the assessment um, from pretest to post-test, um, and the students who started with stronger variational, uh, sorry, transformational views um, further over here on the left-hand side of the spectrum were more likely to benefit from instruction than those on the started with uh, variational views. And here's another way of looking at the data if you look at it by section. And this is something that actually very surprised us. Uh, we weren't expecting the uh, students to make conceptual progress on all sections of the assessment, particularly because the intervention itself never broached the topics of extinction, speciation, or domestication. But the change was actually widespread across the entire assessment. Um, and all those differences were statistically significant. Oh, and we're seeing pretests in the white circles and post-test scores in the, the dark gray, the gray. Um, one piece of data comparing to, to get a sense of how this compares to standard instruction comes from comparing uh, post-test scores in our class to the post-test scores in a class that was labeled evolution. It was an intro level course on biology, but I think targeted at non-majors. Uh, and uh, we couldn't get the instructor of that class to do a pretest, but he did get his students to do a post-test. And in the experimental curriculum, um, their post-test scores were significantly uh, greater than the, the post-test scores for the, the group that was in the standard instruction. Um, so to summarize, at pre-test, most participants demonstrated pervasively transformational views of evolution, um, which is consistent with other work I had done. Um, and uh, the, the effect of the intervention was that it, it shifted individuals from strongly transformational theories to weakly variational theories. Um, but really, it was a mixture of transformational and variational reasoning. Um, but at both uh, time points, participants' responses were consistent, at least as measured by these correlations across section. So is this good evidence um, of an alternative theory? Um, there are a number of people in the science education community who think that uh, students' pre-instructional views of a topic are actually not well described as a theory, that they're much more fragmented and co 
um, incoherent. Um, but there are at least four reasons um, from this data, uh, four pieces of data that would suggest that students did hold alternative theories. Um, first of all, they reveal transformational views across a wide range of phenomena. Um, uh, they appear to be robust in the face of standard instruction, at least in that control group that we um, recruited. They are empirically intercorrelated, which you saw with the correlation matrices, uh, matrices. But beyond that, they're also theoretically intercorrelated. So all the questions were designed specifically to get at a transformational view of evolution. Um, so the fact that they are empirically intercorrelated suggests that the theoretical analysis is correct to some degree. Is it, was this a successful intervention? Um, participants' improvement was small but widespread, and that's actually something that is significantly different from uh, studies on evolution education um, in the literature. Most, there are quite a few published studies that show no improvement from pretest to post-test. So we did see some improvement. Most participants improved their score by at least one point, half by at least five points, a quarter by at least 10 points. Um, and the improvement was widespread across sections. Um, so I can talk more about the nature of the intervention and why it didn't, how it did and didn't work later, but let me now switch gears to talk about some developmental data. Um, so where do these misconceptions come from? Uh, Stephen Jay Gould has written a lot about evolutionary misconceptions. Um, in his book, Full House, he um, uh, talks a lot about this lack of population thinking that pervades not only thinking about evolution, but also thinking about all kinds of topics, from baseball to, um, I don't know, other, uh, other topics. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But he, he points to essentialism as the problem, platonic essentialism. So he says at one point, our platonic heritage prompts us to view means and medians as the hard realities and the variation that permits their calculation as a set of transient and imperfect measurements of this hidden essence. But all evolutionary biologists know that variation itself is nature's only irreducible essence. Variation is the hard reality, not a set of imperfect measures for its central tendency. Means and medians are the abstractions. So um, Gould is saying that Plato introduced this way of thinking into Western thought about emphasizing the essence over the variation, and that has sort of change the way people understand all sorts of population level phenomena. But you don't have to go to Plato to see evidence of essentialism. There's a very large literature in developmental psychology showing that children are essentialists. Um, Two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and possibly infants, but we don't have the, the proper task to know whether or not an infant is an essentialist. Um, basically, what you find is that when you ask children to um, reason about an animal's outward appearance or behavior, they do so on the basis of some inner unobservable nature or essence. Um, so very simply, if you ask a child, uh, or even, it doesn't need to be a child, an adult as well, if, if you want to know why a particular animal eats meat and has claws, a perfectly satisfying explanation is that it's a tiger. And if you want to know, if you push further and say, why is this animal a tiger, then a perfectly satisfying explanation is that its parents were tigers and if it reproduced, it would have tiger babies. So you're appealing to this tiger essence is a very um, widespread and early developing way of explaining the properties and behaviors of the individual animal. So we see essentialism in kids in a variety of different tasks. Um, one task is by teaching kids novel properties of a familiar organism. Say you teach a, ki a kid uh, that cats can see in the dark and then you ask them to extend that property to other animals. And they basically will extend the property to anything you label a cat, um, even if it doesn't look like a cat, even if you present them with a picture of a skunk and label it as a cat. Um, and they won't extend the property if it's labeled something else. So if you show them a picture of a cat and label it as a skunk, they won't assume that that um, organism will have that property. Uh, another task is a task that resembles the uh, ugly duckling story. You tell children about an animal that was taken away from its birth parents and raised by some adoptive parents. So uh, an animal that, that was taken away from mother and father cow and raised by mother and father pig. And then you ask what kinds of properties that animal is going, going to have when it's grown up. Is it going to have a straight tail like a cow or a curly tail like a pig? Is it going to eat grass like a cow or slop like a pig? And they'll say it will have the properties of its birth parents, um, in this case, the properties of a cow. Um, so what we did in, in 
switching gears to, to take a developmental focus was look at how um, these essentialist biases that have been so well documented in terms of how children and adults reason about individual organisms, how they translate to reasoning about whole populations. Um, because when Gould and other historians of biology have pointed to essentialism as being uh, the real obstacle to um, evolutionary theory, they're talking about it in a sense that um, uh, individuals are thinking about species as types, these holistic unified types that have a, an essence that differentiates them from other species. But having an essence means that the, uh, the biologists were underestimating variation within a population. So we were basically looking to see uh, uh, how, how well variation within a population is recognized by participants of different ages. And also among the adults, does recognition of variation within a population correlate with a correct understanding of evolution? So we had 43 kids and 34 adults. Um, and the adults were uh, recruited from the community, not so they weren't a college sample. They ranged to 40. And um, all participants were asked to judge the variability of three types of properties uh, for a range of animals, um, internal, external, and behavioral properties for um, a group of mammals and a group of insects. And um, the adult participants also completed a brief three-question version of the evolution assessment that I outlined earlier. So here's some of the properties that we used. Um, giraffes were uh, one of our mammal exemplars. Um, their behavioral property was sleeping on their feet, um, their external property having spots on their coats, and their internal property having an extra neck joint. Ants were um, one of our insect exemplars. Their behavioral property was living in mounds of dirt, their external property having feelers on their head, and their internal property having a tube-shaped heart. And we were recruiting kids and adults um, from a science museum, so we made sure all of our properties were true of these animals. Um, so as not to implant misconceptions at the museum. <laughs> so we had a book that had animals depicted, um, one animal of each uh, category, uh, I mean a single individual. And then we asked um, the kids these questions in the form of an interview. The adults did it in the form of a survey. Um, so the first question was, did you know that pandas have thumbs on their forepaws? And you kids will always say they knew that the animals had these properties. Um, and then we just um, sort of consolidated that knowledge by giving them a function. Um, yes, they used them to hold bamboo. Which, how did that happen? <laughs> I skipped to the end of my slides. Wait a sec. I must have pressed the secret key. Okay, here we go. Uh, oh, okay, so um, the next question was, do you think that all pandas had thumbs or just most pandas? So this was the question that we used to gauge um, their perception of actual variability in the population. So if they said all, then they were coded as, as claiming there was no actual variability and most that there was at least some variability. And then the next follow-up question was, could a panda be born with a different kind of forepaw? So this was our measure of perceptions of potential variability, regardless of whether you thought the pandas actually varied on this property. And then finally, if they said no, that pandas couldn't be born with a different kind of forepaw, we asked them for a justification. And note that we asked about potential variability in terms of difference as opposed to absence. So we didn't ask, could a panda be born without a forepaw because we didn't want to bring in these, the idea that we're talking about mutant animals that might not be viable. Um, so these are the variability judgments as a function of age, uh, participant group. So we broke our kids down into a younger group and an older group based on a median split. Um, it was somewhat arbitrary. It didn't really matter because the kids were rather uniform in their responses. Um, we've got the black bars indicate uh, judgments of actual variability averaged across all the animals and all the properties, and the gray bars potential variability above and beyond the actual variability. Um, uh, and then the adults were split into two groups based on their score on the evolution assessment. If they got a positive score, they were classified as the variationist adults, and if they got a negative score, as the transformationist adults. And so what you can see here is there is only one group that is reliably endorsing both actual variability and potential variability um, uh, more strongly than would be predicted by chance alone, and that's the variationist adults. 
the transformationist adults are actually responding quite similarly to the children, um, at least in terms of the top of the potential variability. This is looking just at the adult data, where what we did is we split the adults into quartiles based on their variability judgments. Um, so we've got actual variability on the left and potential variability on the right. Um, so the fourth quartile would be the, the adults who were most likely to endorse actual variability. And on the left-hand side, their mean um, evolution comprehension score on that brief assessment that ranged from negative three to positive three. And what you can see is basically only the adults in the fourth quartile of the actual variability and the potential variability measures had positive comprehension assessment scores indicative of sa a sound understanding of natural selection. So now this is a graph that looks at the type of variation endorsed, which also is interesting with respect to the difference between transformationist adults and variationist adults. Um, so the younger children, the older children, and the transformational adults were all significantly more likely to accept behavioral variability than they were to accept anatomical variability, regardless of whether we're talking about an internal anatomical feature or an external anatomical feature. Um, the variationist, variationist adults, on the other hand, um, uh, showed a different pattern. They were least likely to accept internal anatomical variability, um, but they were just as likely to accept external anatomical variability as behavioral variability. And the reason for that dip in the internal anatomical variability was that occasionally they thought that the organisms would not be viable if you changed. They were born with a different kind of heart, um, uh, for example. So now the last piece of data I will show you are the uh, justifications. We split the justifications into two groups. Um, there were species-based justifications where participants appealed to basically the uniformity of the species, either within a generation or across generations. So there were things like all grasshoppers are the same, the baby kangaroo will be like its parents. Um, and they're not particularly informative justifications. They're basically just reiterating you know, that organisms cannot be born with a difference in this property because they're all the same, period. Um, then we had another category of justifications that were a little bit more explanatorily useful, the property-based ones, where they appealed to the necessity of having that property for the viability of, of the um, offspring. So pandas need thumbs in order to eat, an ant couldn't survive with a different kind of heart. And again, what we found is that the transformationist adults paired with the children in terms of their, um, their modal justifications. Um, so the youngest children tended to provide uh, species-based justifications. Um, so did the older children, and so did the transformationist adults. It's about a 50-50 split. The variationist adults, on the other hand, gave a very different pattern. They very rarely provided species-based justifications. Instead, they tended to talk about the necessity of having a particular property for the viability of the um, offspring. And something I should also point out is that the totals don't add up to one um, for the variationist adults because some adults in this group said that every property could potentially vary. So they were never asked to give a justification as to why a property couldn't vary. Um, and the kids, occasionally, they didn't add up to one because some kids just said, I don't know, and they didn't have an informative reason for their judgments. So to summarize, um, most participants w um, from four-year-old children up to 40-year-old adults deny that within species variation is both actually prevalent and uh, potentially probable. Um, only adults who demonstrated a sound understanding of natural selection, um, at least as assessed by, by my assessment tool, um, endorsed within species variation, both actual variation and potential variation. And the adults who did not demonstrate a sound understanding of natural selection, the transformationist adults, they actually provided response patterns that were qu uh, quantitatively and qualitatively similar to the children's response patterns, implying that um, the, the way that they're reasoning about variation hasn't changed much um, up to that point in time from when they were a child. So some conclusions. Um, it would appear that um, these essentialist biases that have been documented in the developmental literature with respect to the properties that an individual organism does or does not have appear to be connected to evolution and, and constrain um, the uh, uh, child's and adult's understanding of evolution in a way that's similar to how um, essentialist biases were proposed to constrain um, early biologists' theories of evolution. 
Um, essentialism is a useful inductive tool. If it weren't, it probably wouldn't exist. Um, so it's useful when thinking about species as a whole and the properties that any individual is going to have um, with respect to other individuals. Um, so you can make predictions about a particular organism just be on knowing um, who its parents were or what its species kind is. But it's not a particularly useful bias for reasoning about evolution because it leads to the devaluation of within species variation. And then if you devalue within species variation, you'll devalue mechanisms that operate over that variation, in this case, natural selection. All right. So the last thing I wanted to tell you about is um, going back to the adult data and looking at how misconceptions about evolution relate to acceptance of evolution. Um, so is it the case that having a sound understanding of evolution leads to greater acceptance of evolution as true? Um, there are a number of studies in the literature demonstrating no connection between these two things. Um, here are some examples. Um, so these are studies where both understanding and acceptance were measured within the same population, and there just was no correlation. So a lot of people have looked at this data and, and thought there probably is no connection between understanding and acceptance, that you can understand evolution and not accept it, or you can fail to understand it and acceptance. And acceptance is based more on things like religious fundamentalism and the influence of uh, one's peer group, one's, um, one's cultural setting. But it's also possible that the comprehension um, measures used in these earlier studies were not sufficiently sensitive to this distinction between variational theories of evolution and transformational theories of evolution that we've been picking up on. So um, to look at that, um, the students in that teaching intervention study, in addition to having their understanding of evolution measured, they also were given a, a five questions that uh, assess their acceptance of evolution. So in particular, they were given these five statements and asked to rate their endorsement of these, uh, their agreement with these statements on a one to five scale. Um, the statements were species have changed over time, so just a base measure that things evolve. Um, species in existence, the species in existence today have not always existence, so this would be endorsement of speciation. Natural selection is the best explanation for how species adapt to their environment. Natural selection is the best explanation for the origin of new, new species. And uh, the origin of human beings does not require a different explanation than the origin of other species. So these are ordered in terms of increasing uh, controversiality. So we know from other studies that this is the most controversial claim, whereas people will tend to accept evolution in the abstract pretty readily. It's really, it's when you get to human evolution, that, that's a major sticking point. Um, so what we found is that endorsement of these statements did in fact correlate with um, assessment scores, both at pre-test and post-test. So these are, this is an abbreviated version of the statement, and what's next to it is the correlation between accepting that statement and scoring as a variationist on the comprehension assessment. Um, so there, there are some differences from pre-test to post-test. Overall, the correlations were rather strong and rather um, robust. Another uh, finding from the study was that endorsement of these statements changed um, across instruction. So we've got um, the white bars here representing uh, the percentage of subjects who agreed or strongly agreed with these various statements um, noted down below just by their number um, at pretest, and then the gray bars are for endorsement at post-test. And um, there was a significant change in the percent who agreed with the statement Statements two, three, and five. Um, so those statements are uh, statements about speciation, um, natural selection explaining adaptation, and five we were particularly happy to see, which is the endorsement that humans do in fact evolve. All right, so to summarize, um, Variational reasoning was correlated with the acceptance of evolution, or you could spin it differently. Um, transformational reasoning was correlated with skepticism toward evolution. Um, so as participants' um, understanding of evolution was increasing over the course of the semester, their acceptance of evolution was also increasing. And uh, now um, I just draw a few theoretical implications from this group set of data as a whole and then a few practical implications. Did you have a clear? Mm -hmm. um, the correlation, can you go back to the, um, 
before that, right there. So it looks like people that are tested as variationalists post-test, it doesn't correlate with their acceptance of, of natural selection best explains human origins? Oh, well, the, the, um, the, the, the strength of the correlation is also dependent on ceiling and floor effects, so you're getting more people accepting it. It's still, there's a lot of variation, so I don't... Um, but certainly with this top one, everybody is accepting that statement at both pretest and post-test, so there's not a lot of variation to, to go into the correlation. I'm not exactly sure how to explain this last part because there was still, there was still a lot of variation in total acceptance. Well, maybe not a huge amount of variation. All right. Um, so these data um, contribute to a growing literature in developmental psychology suggesting that inductive biases um, have their place in some contexts and, and don't have a place in others. Um, so there are many biases that are being studied. Um, intentional biases, teleological biases, biases to interpret physical events as being caused by contact causality, things like that. In this particular case, it looks like essentialism, which is very useful for reasoning about individual organisms, appears to be um, uh, detrimental for reasoning about population level phenomena. And it's probably not a coincidence that modern day students hold theories of evolution that resemble pre-Darwinian theories. It's probably the case that essentialist biases were at play, are at play in both contexts, that the essentialist biases led many pre-Darwinian theorists um, to devalue within species variation and fail to discover natural selection in the same way that students in today's science classrooms are devaluing within species variation. Um, and so getting students to appreciate within species variation requires targeted um, instruction. And I don't know if our instructional intervention is the best, but we're, we're working towards a, a better set of um, interventions. Practically speaking, um, the, the mild, the moderate success of our intervention suggests that getting students to understand counterintuitive concepts might be done really well by getting them to derive the concepts for themselves. Um, so other interventions that have uh, been shown not to be so successful are interventions where they, um, uh, evolution is taught from a historical perspective or uh, evolution is taught in the context of an inquiry-based curriculum. These things don't seem to be particularly effective. Um, but maybe this idea of deriving natural selection from first principles is a, is a good path to pursue. Um, the data also suggests that if you can foster an understanding of counterintuitive concepts, then acceptance of those concepts might follow behind. And in general, there, aren't, there isn't a lot of controversy uh, surrounding scientific concepts, like there isn't a group of people who don't believe in entropy or inertia. Um, but this might have some implications for climate change, that maybe fostering a better understanding of climate change would create a greater acceptance of climate change. It also suggests that in debates about whether or not evolution has a place in the classroom, that a lot of people, potentially on both sides of the debate, are actually debating the wrong theory of evolution. Um, in all the studies that I've done, the majority of subjects have demonstrated pervasive transformational views, um, even students from Harvard University. <laughs> um, so I'll just end on some questions that my colleague, um, Prasetta Kalabi, and I are currently pursuing. Um, one thing is we're looking at how prior knowledge influences the acquisition of evolutionary concepts. Um, it looks like uh, um, actually having a little bit of knowledge is a bad thing because it leads students to uh, think they know too much possibly and, and assimilate uh, what they're learning. That if you enter the classroom with very robust, um, pervasive misconceptions, um, you tend to make more um, conceptual progress. Um, it also doesn't appear to be the case that some concepts are more critical to the achievement of variational reasoning than others. So we've um, replicated this effect um, two, three times over that uh, if you do show conceptual progress over the course of instruction, it tends to be pervasive across all aspects of our survey, from uh, microevolutionary topics like adaptation and um, inheritance to macroevolutionary topics like speciation and extinction, even if those connections were not explicitly drawn by the instructor. And the last thing we're looking at is whether or not essentialist slash transformational beliefs are supplanted um, as you learn the correct concepts or they're just suppressed by them. Because there's still room for essentialist reasoning in everyday folk biological thought that 
when somebody who has a perfectly clear understanding of evolution thinks about individual organisms, it's likely they still do um, default to a more rudimentary um, essentialist um, notion of species kind when thinking about the properties of individual organisms. So let me just thank my um, collaborators, uh, Susan Carey, Laura Schultz at MIT, and Prasetta Kalabi at UMass Boston, and um, my research assistants. Thanks.